Thank you, Nick, and to the praise team uh, for that time of worship. Uh, truly in singing, but also truly in the word uh, with the lyrics that we were blessed to sing. Good morning to each of you. Thank you. It is good to be with you. It's a joy, as always, uh, to be here this morning. And uh, this morning, we're wrapping up the short series we've been on. Uh, we began it just a few weeks ago, uh, where we define our philosophy of ministry. We have a lot of, of new faces, a lot of folks uh, who maybe don't know the fullness of why we do what we do, what kind of defines and shapes our pursuits and our actions. Uh, but we also have, as a good reminder for those of you who may have heard this before, uh, it's a great reminder just to, to continually bring before us what is the philosophy of ministry uh, here at Community Baptist Church. Now to remind you, just as philosophy of ministry is simply said, a set of unalterable principles that determine how we function in ministry for the sake of the gospel. This is what defines why we do what we do. How we do the things that we do. We refer to these uh, here at uh, CBC as our ministry non-negotiables, or if you've been on our website, you've possibly seen our five non-negotiables. They are a high view of God. The lens through which we will see this world, through all that we do, is beginning with foundationally a high view of God. Number two, a commitment to the sufficiency of God's word, of scripture. Number three, a biblical view of humanity, of man. Number four, we looked at last week, a biblically defined purpose of the church. And number five, where we'll be this morning, a right view of church leadership. As we've shared throughout this series, these non-negotiables, they're not exhaustive. There are multiple other things that you can think of from God's word that you would say, well, that's non-negotiable. We would never waver on that truth. And that's correct. There are multiple others. However, we believe that these five encompass God's intended purpose for a ministry and give us a lens by which we might view every other thing that we do and see it rightly. They're not exhaustive, but they are encompassing. Also, as we looked at them, you, you can't pick your top four and ignore the fifth one, or your top three, or vice versa. You can't do that because they interact and function with each other. In other words, you can claim to have a high view of God, but if you don't have a commitment to the sufficiency of his word, you will never have a right view of man, and you will not understand what is the purpose of the church as his word defines it. These all function interactively together and are necessary to each other. Now this morning... We're going to be finishing our series with number five, a right view of church leadership. And as we saw last week, and I would restate to us, God's design for his church is the only right view of its structure or purpose, how we should do it. It's his church. One of the things you'll hear repeatedly is Christ is the head of the church. This is so often misunderstood. I remember at one point asking, uh, at the beginning part of the ministry here, just asking who's in charge of the church. And multiple people saying things from the pastor to the deacons to this to that. And, and the reality is when I would say, but isn't Christ the head of his church? Well, of course. I mean, we know that. I would say very simply, I don't believe that Christ's headship over the church is something we should assume upon. Or more pointedly, presume upon. I think that we should recognize it in the authority that he brings to it in his stated word, in the mind of Christ that we're given in the word of God as to how we should do what we do. One of my professors wrote a book that's been super instructional in all of this, and he says this, doing God's business God's way. We should do it in accordance with how he has given it to be done. And so recognizing that, the purpose of the church, we saw last week, is ultimately to glorify God. Like we as individuals who make up the body's purpose is to glorify God. So also is the church gathered to glorify God. That's the foundational aspect. That's the high view of God that we looked at four weeks ago. Coming into play in every aspect of what we do. We should be those who gathering this morning. And the church is a wonderful opportunity for that. If you as an individual we saw are to be glorifying God in your life. How much more so when you gather with other individuals who are to be glorifying God in your life, can you fully accomplish the glorification of God? As much as I love to sing praises to God in, in my car, and I do, uh, I sing the same songs we're singing here and, and others throughout the day of driving and other things, how much more amazing and joyful is it that I can gather and hear the voices around me of brothers and sisters 
singing those same songs. It's just a greater ability to accomplish the purpose that God has created us for. We saw last week that biblically defined, there are four pillars or purposes that must be upheld in order to accomplish this as God has designed it. We gave the illustration of, of viewing it as a table with four legs, legs that cannot be removed or will collapse and no longer function as a table. The first one is the church is to be that which upholds truth. Uh, in First Timothy, Paul describes it in that way to, to Timothy, saying to him, it is the pillar and buttress of the truth. The second thing is that it is to be that which is equipping the saints for the work of mission, ministry. It's supposed to be a saint equipper. You should be gathered this morning, the church should be functioning, not only this morning, but in all of its endeavors to equip the saints for the work of ministry, Ephesians chapter 4. Also, it is to be a mutual encourager and protector in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, when Paul describes the work of the individuals within the church, the term edification to one another, the guardianship over one another, Hebrews 3, Matthew 18, protecting one another, is an absolute aspect of why we gather. And then the fourth part is to make disciples. We're, we're to be those who are salt and light. We're to be those who are fulfilling the commission our Lord has given us, that we might, within the community and beyond, be making disciples of Jesus Christ. We have seen, and I hope that you recognize, that the church is God's gracious gift to his people. That God has given us a body whereby we may more fully experience the upholding of truth. Where we might be equipped for the work of ministry. Where we might be mutually encouraged, edified, and protected among those who are like-minded going through the same things. And whereby we might be renewed in our mind, refreshed, that we might be salt and light in the circles that we live in outside of these walls. It is a gift, it is a tool, so to speak, for the accomplishment of what God's commands and calls are in our lives as individuals. It's one body, made up of individual members, gifted and placed by God, gathered in local assemblies to display His glory. That's what it is. This week, I want us to understand that just as He gave the church as a gift to His people, He also gave to His church gifted people for the carrying out of these things. One area of this giftedness, and it's only one area, it's not the only one, there are multiple ones, but one area that we're going to focus on this morning is the leadership of the church. Those who are given the task of shepherding the flock, the body of Christ, the family of God. A few years ago, if you'll remember, if you were here, we, we taught through God's design for leadership in his body, recognizing that the biblical design is found in a plurality of qualified men that we here at Community Baptist Church recognize as elders. Elders, and I just want to give you a quick recap. If you weren't here, or maybe if you were, it was a, it was a very foundational time for our church to understand these things. And the first thing I would say is that the terms you find for leadership within the Bible are found in three distinct titles. Uh, the term elder, the term bishop, or the term pastor or, or shepherd. In the first thing we recognized a few years ago in teaching through this is these titles are interchangeable. In other words, they're all addressing the same person. For example, we see this happen in our own time. Uh, culturally, we would understand that some people might say, you know, I got pulled over last week by a sheriff's deputy. Or they might say, you know, I got stopped by the police last week. It's the, recognizing the same person, the same office, so to speak. However, it's doing so from the perspective of the one saying it. Uh, to give you maybe a better example, consider this. We have a president of the United States. If you are in the military, you're to refer to him as the commander in chief. He's the same person, he's the same office, but perspective is different depending on where you're at in that. So it's the same thing you see in scripture. It's same title, same person, different view and usage descriptive of the context that it's being used in. And that's going to be extremely important for us to understand this morning. There's a context, and we're going to look at this more fully. What I want you to see is how the congregation is to view leadership and how leadership is to view leadership. Scripture gives us such clarity on both of those, and it's, if we don't see that rightly, it will never be carried out properly. Likewise, as we see within the context of our day, bishops and pastors are not distinct from elders. The terms are simply different ways of identifying the same people. The Greek word for bishop is the term episkopos. 
from which the Episcopal Church gets its name. The Greek word for pastor is the term poimen, and the word for elders is the term presbyteros. The textual evidence is clear, and it shows us that all, these, all three of these terms refer to exactly the same office. In Titus, Paul refers, uses two of the terms to refer to the same man. In Titus 1, 5, and 7, he says this, For this reason I left you, Titus, in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders, the term presbyteros, in every city as I directed you. For the overseer, episkopos, must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain. And so you see him using both those terms to describe the exact same person. In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter brings all of the terms together in a single context in verses 1 and 2. Peter speaking to them, he says this, Therefore, I exhort the elders, the term presbyteros among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. He then says this, shepherd, which is coming from the root word that we saw meaning pastor or shepherd. Here it's used poimano, the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, episcopeo, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. One more example, if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 20. We are going to be in Acts chapter 20 pretty repeatedly through this morning. But there's so much confusion over this. People will speak in terms of, well, who's the pastor? Well, what does it mean that you have elders? And we want you to have clarity in that. We want you to have biblical clarity and understanding the leadership structure of Community Baptist Church and what that means for you. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 20, Paul, having assembled the elders... In his farewell address, tells them this. In verse 28, he says to them, Be on guard for yourselves and for all of the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. And so in verse 17, it says, He sent to Ephesus and gathered him the elders, presbyteros of the church. And when they had come, verse 18, he said to them, Who is he speaking to? To the elders he had gathered. And then he goes into verse 28, and he gives us this word. To the elders that he had gathered, he says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all of the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you, overseers, episkopos, to shepherd Pomano, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that's a lot, but it simply sums up, hopefully giving you an understanding that those terms, pastor or shepherd, elder or overseer, are all referring biblically to exactly the same person. They're used interchangeably. It also describes the same duties, the same responsibilities. This is one singular view that Scripture brings to bear. Now, we also recognize in that time, and again, we won't spend all this morning with it, but I want to give you this refresher. The consistent pattern throughout the New Testament is that each local body of believers is shepherded by a plurality of God-ordained elders. I would go further and say it this way. It is the only pattern for church leadership given in the New Testament. In every epistle that addresses this, in every function and structure, in the carrying out of it, it is always the only pattern found in Scripture to address the governance or leadership of the body of Christ, the church. Nowhere not one place in Scripture does one find a local assembly ruled by either a majority opinion or by a singular pastor or shepherd. It doesn't exist in the Bible. That's important. Remember, we want to be those who do what God has given us according to how God has commanded us to do it. A wrong view of this gift of leadership to his church will break down the purpose of his church. And sadly, we find oftentimes a wrong view being perpetrated within the church from both directions. From both directions. We're going to look at it from the perspective of those in leadership who can absolutely get a wrong view, oftentimes do, and the damage it does. But also from the membership who views the leadership that they've been given as a gift wrongly and how that affects. This morning, I want to look at it from two different perspectives. I want to look at a right view of church leadership from how the leadership should view it as a responsibility. Uh, that's the first thing I want you to understand, that leadership, according to Scripture, should view their role as a responsibility. 
And then the membership should view that as a servanthood that bears authority because of that responsibility. As we said, if you're in Acts chapter 20, we're going to look at verse 28, and there's, there's this picture that Paul gives us of the unique design of God, wherein those who are sheep are also called the shepherd. It's only by God's design that we would ever recognize this. That those who are in leadership within the church are those who themselves are also sheep. They're blood-bought, saved by grace, brothers, as it pertains to everyone else. There's no distinction in the manner by which they were saved. There's no distinction in the, in the uh, affluence of who they are. They're simply those who have been appointed by God to do the work of shepherding by his gifting. And there are many gifts, and each individual believer has a gift which the Lord has given them to use into the body. In Acts chapter 20, if you're there, we want to see that. Again, this is the Apostle Paul exhorting the men of the church in Ephesus, the elders of the church, where he's been ministering for about the last three years, and he's about to leave, and in his absence, he's giving them this final exhortation to fulfill their responsibilities to the church. This is what he says to them. Look at verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves, and for all of the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So the first thing I want us to see in this is that those who are given the role of shepherding are given a task of a safe guardian. They're given to safeguard the ministry. And this is important for how we as leaders should see it, and it's also important for how you as the congregation should see leadership. It's described here plainly for us, and it has two different fronts. Please understand the order, as I say oftentimes about this verse, is as inspired as the words. In other words, if you believe in an inerrant, inspired scripture, it also means that not just the words of scripture, but the order in which the Holy Spirit gave them are significant. He begins with this in verse 20. Be on guard for yourselves. The first safe guardian role that a shepherd or an elder or an overseer has, the first line of defense for the church is found in the character of the men leading it. Absolutely essential. We're going to see this time and time and time again. It's in the character. Paul's commands and exhortation to the elders begins with this. Men, keep watch over yourselves. Make sure that your righteousness, which is found in Christ, is always resulting in humility, is always resulting in holiness. There are elements within our lives that Paul is clearly giving to the leadership that says your character is of first importance. That's the first line of defense for the church. The loss of this within any body is devastating to the body. It does absolute damage to the entire body if there is a breakdown in the character of leadership. In other words, know this. A man who is not qualified by God's standard is a man unable to accomplish God's tasks and will result in a redefining of those tasks, which will ultimately result in something called a church, which will no longer resemble a church. In other words, if a man is not qualified according to God's standard to do God's task, he will redefine that task in such a way that fits his abilities. And it won't function as it's intended. This is essentially important. I tell people all the time, understanding these qualifications, understanding these distinctions is not something that elevates men to a position of stardom or to a view looking up to us in a way beyond the exemplary nature of the character. To give you an example, I use this all the time. I would love to fly a helicopter. I would. I think it'd be really cool. I could think of all kinds of things I would do if I was able to fly a helicopter, things I could see and, and participate and go to and other things. But the worst possible thing, this year, uh, Brother Lonnie, who leads our school, was able, last year, was able to get the Martin County Sheriff's Department. I, I pulled up one day, and there's a helicopter sitting in our parking lot, and it's even running. It was already cranked up. Now, as much as I would desire to fly that helicopter, the worst possible thing I could do is go jump in it and try and take off. And the worst possible thing that could happen is if I somehow managed to get it off the ground. Because then I've got to land it. Now on the other side of that though, we have a man, one of our elders, who flew helicopters at a very young age. He flew in the Vietnam War. He's very capable and qualified 
in his ability to fly helicopters. If Brother Larry Thrasher said, let's go for a spin, I'm in. And that's just the recognition. The role of leadership is one that carries with it very distinct and unique tasks. We're to exhort in sound doctrine. We're to refute those who contradict. We're to quiet the mouths of those who are doing damage to the flock. It is not an easy task. It is not one that you would want to take lightly. And in all of those commands, of which I've given you but a few, you would not want to be someone who's not qualified, therefore capable, and then jump in and try and do it anyhow. So that's why it's so important to recognize this safeguarding reality of the role of leadership. Oftentimes, I will read in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, Christ addresses several local assemblies, churches, and lays his charges against them. And in so doing, I ask myself, what would he say to us as a church? If Christ were to write a Revelation 2 or 3 letter to Community Baptist Church, what is it that we need to guard stronger against? What is it that we need to shift, change, or become what we ought to be? Where have we shifted from what Christ has intended for us to be? Those letters are very sobering and a great reminder for who we are to be. Oftentimes what we see instead is pragmatism. Pragmatism rules the day. The question is not, hath God said this? The question is, doth it work well? That's not the picture in Scripture. God's gifting is always preceded by his qualifications. It's always exampled by his qualifications. Too much today is defend, de defined, well, how much do men receive it? How much do they like it? In other words, this guy must be qualified. Look at the crowd he's able to draw. This guy must be qualified. People really like to hear his words. They'll come for miles to hear him or for those things. That's not a negation, should never be a negation of the qualifications given in Scripture. We are told in Scripture, the man who doesn't build upon the rock, the storm will come, their house will fall, and great will be its fall or destruction. Sadly, we see this happening. Churches will, will flare up and rise to a position of prominence under the, the personality of their leadership. Able to draw a crowd. People really like to hear him speak. He's very handsome. He's very this. There's multiple things that I've heard over time. And then sadly what happens, the most high profile, when something comes that, that reveals a lack of character, if they were not examined rightly in that, be it adultery, immorality, financial sin, you've all heard, possibly experienced the horror stories. What happens to that body? Great damage. Great is the fall and damage and fallout of it. Oftentimes, it goes the other way. There are those who go into ministry, promise something which ministry decisively cannot give them. And they leave disillusioned after a short go at it. I hear this so many times where people will say, well, we gave it a try. We gave it a try. And what they're saying is we went up, we begin to shepherd this body of Christ and it didn't work out. And so now we're back, we're going to do something else. And there's a church in ruins because of that. We, we gave it a try. Do you know what the average lifespan in church ministry is for leadership at any given ministry? Less than three years. Less than three years is the national average. According to the most recent survey I could find from a credible source about two and a half years ago. Did you know that according to that same survey, more than 1,500 pastors or elders leave the ministry each month here in America, either disqualified or disillusioned? Men, we must guard ourselves continually. Paul didn't throw this in there just as an afterthought. It's an absolutely essential aspect of the role of leadership that they have a safeguarding ministry that begins first and foremost with them. I would say it this way. If my relationship with the Lord is not as it should be, I am of no value to anyone in front of me. It must begin this direction, and then there is value to be had this direction. And so Paul gives us that in Acts chapter 20 to the elders, saying, you in leadership must have a safeguarding ministry that begins first and foremost with the guardianship over yourself. The second aspect of that is a guardianship, a safeguarding, safeguarding ministry over the flock. Over the flock. That's the second part of our role. He says, men, there will be savage wolves 
that will come wanting to do damage. Wolves who are hard to see because they come in sheep's clothing. You must continually be on guard, be on the watch. Now some of the dangers that show themselves throughout the New Testament and into our generation today is, is false doctrine. False doctrine. We can be continually blown, it says, here and there in our immaturity by every wind of doctrine that comes our way. False doctrine can lead us astray. False doctrine is the teeth by which the wolves tear sheep apart. We're told that deceitful schemes, deceitful schemes, schemes whereby men want to elevate themselves. They want that position. We hear the Pharisees are continually confronted by Christ in what way? You want the position of honor. You want to be seen by men. You have no design or desire for the glory of the Lord to be shown through what you're doing. Deceitful schemes whereby sheep are led astray and used for the furtherance of man's plans. We must be on guard for these things which are happening. They are happening all around and continually sadly. Where false doctrine and deceitful schemes are being perpetrated upon sheep continually. The other thing that we see, and it kind of flips the script a little bit, is there are those who are willing to feed the sheep what their itching ears desire. Instead of upholding truth, confronting sin, and dealing with the biblical non-negotiables that we've been walking through, there will be those who with a desire to be popular, to have that place of headship at the table. Those who with a desire to, or a fear of man, not wanting to confront that which will rob them of their popularity. These are all the things which continually creep in upon both the leader and is continually seeking to make inroads into those being led. This is the biblical picture that there are sheep being fed with their itching ears desire. This is what we must be guarding against. And then finally, not the only one, but the last one I have for us this morning, there's division within the body. Continually we're warned. Titus 3 says, if a man brings division in the body... Warn him once, warn him twice, and then have nothing more to do with him. Division within the body is a destructive, destructive tool that savage wolves use to destroy the flock, to destroy and tear the sheep. Because it robs the body of what? Its ability to accomplish any kingdom work. It becomes, it makes the body so busy with biting and devouring and infighting and struggling that you don't even need a wolf in the midst of that. He just needs to bring that to bear and then step back and let sheep do the rest of division and other things. God hates it. He addresses it clearly multiple times. This is a danger that we must be in leadership and within the flock on guard continually against. How do we do that? How is that to be accomplished? Well, strong leadership feeding a steady diet of right doctrine results in mature sheep. The more that you know, the more that you recognize what's false. Again, a very common illustration, but one that has absolute bearing on this. When you ask the Secret Service how it is that they train their counterfeit team to recognize counterfeit bills, they say very clearly, we do not show them all the different counterfeits because there are so many ways and so many new things being done. There's no way to possibly ever train them on all the different types of counterfeit bills or types of ways that counterfeit can be carried out. So what we do is we make them study the real one. We make them study it to the degree that they know it. They know it personally and intimately. They know it well. They know every aspect of what makes it real. And therefore, they are much more capable in recognizing what is false as it comes. Strong leadership feeding a steady diet of right doctrine results in mature, mature sheep. And mature sheep see danger on their own. They see danger on their own. They see it coming and know it for what it is. A mature Christian is one who responds, not reacts rightly to sin. Now I will say this, this responsibility of dealing with wolves, guarding the flock, is rarely present in the moment. Because it is often contrary to possibly the sheep's desire and definitely to the one who would be recognized as a wolf. In verse 31 of Acts chapter 20, where you're already at, Paul speaks of this. He says, therefore, be on the alert. And he tells this about himself, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, 
I did not cease to admonish, admonish each one with tears. Diligent, protective, shepherding, shepherding results in both well-fed and well-led sheep. It's admonishing. It's the work of admonishing, encouraging, caring for. In verse 28, to go back to that, he tells them, be on the guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And this is why he's done it, in order to, or to, shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The term overseers can often be wrongly viewed by leadership over time. The worldly view of this would say something like this, I'm in charge. They would see the term overseer as meaning, hey, I'm in charge. The biblical view says, no, you should see it as I'm responsible. I'm responsible for this flock. I'm responsible. More than that, we're going to see in Scripture, I'm responsible to the degree that when I stand before God himself, I will give an account to him for the way in which I shepherded, cared for, protected his people. The second right view of church leadership by church leaders for them to recognize themselves is a view of servant leadership. One of the things we continually press in in our members class is understanding rightly that we are here to serve you. To be clear, we are not here to serve you according to your felt needs. Uh, and it's not like Walmart. The customer is not always right. Okay, we are here to serve you according to the biblical truth that we have been entrusted with. We are here to serve you sometimes in spite of you, sometimes contrary to you. But in all ways, our role, and you should see it that way, is to serve you. It's not to exercise authority. That's not how you should view us. You should view church leadership as that which is there as servants to the flock. He issued, Jesus himself issued the command, and he set the example, did he not? Look with me at Matthew 20. <clears throat> In this, I'm going to give you some clarity, I hope, through this message, that Christ is not contradicting himself, that the scripture does not contradict itself, that even as we recognize your view towards leadership as one that bears authority, when Christ says to those who are going to lead his church that they're not to exercise authority, he's not contradicting himself. He's giving us two different views. Remember, the leadership is not to look at their role of leadership and say, I'm in charge, that I'm to exercise this authority. They're to see it as a responsibility. But there is a measure, as we will see, whereby the congregation is to see the authority of those entrusted with God's role of leading the church. But first, let's begin with us seeing it rightly. Matthew 20. Beginning in verse 25. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, meaning Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Christ very clearly exhorts us in how he wants for those in leadership to carry themselves, to recognize, and he himself set the example for it. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5, another text where, where we see the same principle as Peter says it to his fellow elders, to those who are in leadership over the body alongside of him or with him. 1 Peter chapter 5. Verses 1 through 4. Peter, in writing to the church, to the diaspora, we're told in the beginning, to those believers who were scattered, he says this to those whom received his letter. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you. Exercising oversight not under compulsion, but voluntarily. According to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. He goes on and says this, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You see, this view of one entrusted with a great responsibility 
is a view that would protect the bride of Christ from so much foolishness and harm that has been visited upon her over the years. When I address young men about the weight of pursuing a young lady to take a wife, I address them as believers from the perspective of them being God's own daughter, of them recognizing that they're taking on the responsibility of a daughter of the king. That should bring much weight to bear, and oftentimes does, for the young men. Elders, leaders within the church, need to recognize the weight of the responsibility they bear to his bride. To treat her as she should be treated. To guard, to protect, to serve her. Acts 28 tells us this role again, 20 and verse 28, just to reiterate it again. We are to be those who are to shepherd, to care for the church of God. And here's the weight of that, which he purchased with his own blood. Listen, leaders of God's flock are servants. False leaders are those who seek to rule over. True leaders are those who protect from. It's the essential picture you see all over the pages of Scripture. Both are difficult. Both will result in sometimes the same thing. Oftentimes protecting one who is in the flock from sin that they desire will result in the same response from them as if you were truly sinfully trying to lord it over them. It has oftentimes the same outcome, but the biblical distinction is absolutely clear. Those in leadership, according to 1 Peter 5, Acts chapter 20, Jesus in Matthew 20 should see their role through the lens of their responsibility for the flock. And those who are being led should see their lens through, or should see their leadership through the lens of the authority that Christ has given them according to his word. Our third point deals with that. A right view of church leadership by you, by the membership. And this is where we use the word, you should see it as authoritative. Now I want to walk through that more fully because this one's interesting. We just saw Jesus describe that unbelievers in leadership exercise authority, but for his people, they will exercise service. And yet then I say to you that you should view leadership as having authority or authoritative into your life. And I think what it comes down to is, is Christian leaders, what was said to me at the very beginning of my ministry, should be those who lead and don't drive the sheep. Such a helpful picture for me to understand. It was said to me that, that a true leader will be one who recognizes the responsibility for the sheep that their leadership brings to their heart, to their life. And a false leader would recognize more the authority than their responsibility, and it will show itself in heavy-handedness and a driving of the sheep. And this person said this, he says, you will know, because if you make greener pastures, biblical truth, like transitioning to the plurality of leadership within our body, knowing that that is the biblical principle that we want to adhere to, we still slowly went through that process. The reason is because we want to be those who lead and not drive. If we make the things of Scripture as the greener pastures, as one who himself has worked on ranches and other things, if I make the greener pasture the point, and I drive the sheep to that pasture, and I get to that pasture, and I look around, and I say, isn't this great that we're now standing here in this lush, green pasture that the Lord has provided for us? And I look at the sheep, and they are woebegone. They have broken legs, many diseases and infections because I've been so busy driving them where I want them to be, where they need to be, that I've not been leading them. This was such a helpful understanding for me that we need to be those who are always leading to where we ought to be, the greener pasture, so to speak. But we should be doing so with gentleness and patience. That we should be doing so in such a way that guards those whom we're leading, making them, in many ways, the point of our leading. If it's all about just glorifying him, and there's no measure of dealing with people, then there's no point in us doing this. That is going to be accomplished perfectly and fully in heaven. But while we are yet here, we need to be those who are leading and not driving. Now there is a time for driving. There is a time if there's a wolf in the midst, if there is a cliff on the horizon. There are times for, for urgency, and we see that. 
but for the most part, we need to be those who are continually committed to. And I, and I want to be clear to you, you can't lead sheep anywhere in less than three years. This idea that's being perpetrated on the church, that church leadership's average time is under three years, and that's somehow acceptable, you can't lead sheep anywhere in three years. It takes time and growth and responsibility and steady diet and ministering and all the different things of the responsibility that we should see it as. The flip side, though, is how then should you as the congregation view your leadership's roles in the church? Interestingly enough, when I ask the average person who professes Christ, what authority does the church have in your life? The answers are, are very clear. They're very quick. They would say things like this, authority? <laughs> what do you mean, authority? Uh, you know, I went to a church one time, they tried that, but I showed them. I left that church where they were judging me, and I found a church that accepted me for who I am. Yeah, I had a church that, that tried to exercise authority over me, but they just didn't let me use my gifts to the degree that I wanted to use them. So I went and started my own church where I can exercise the gifts that the Holy Spirit's given me. Authority? Are you kidding me? You mean like the police have? You see, there's a measure where there's so much confusion over this, we want to bring as much clarity as possible. Now potentially, true, you should leave if the church leadership had a wrong view of their role. If they had a wrong view of their role, if they were exercising authority as unbelievers do, seeing their role as I'm in charge, rather than I'm responsible. However, too often, what comes from this is an excuse to continue in the sin that they were being confronted with, which God's word says will lead to their destruction. There's an amazing passage in Malachi 2 that deals with faithful priests or faithful caregivers, shepherds of God's people in the Old Testament. And in that, it says that one of their roles is that they should be those who are turning men from their iniquity. We in leadership should be viewing sin in the lives of the sheep as a piece of barbed wire that has become entangled around their neck. And even as they don't want you to catch up to them and deal with it, we know that it is going to lead to infection, possible strangulation, and multiple other maladies that will destroy them. And so we want to do the work of shepherding them rightly. If a church is taught properly, if a church is loved properly, it will be led properly. And it will follow proper, clear, loving direction. I tell people all the time, you have the same guidebook. You have the same handbook. You should be examining the things. You should be questioning the things. You should do so and have the expectation that that will be handled with the Bible open between you. Not always to your satisfaction, meaning that there are times we see Paul in Philippians chapter 3. I love this passage. It's so shaped so much of how I view these struggles. He says in that passage, if any of you hold a different view than this, the Lord will deal with you. You have to give a measure for the Lord to deal with certain aspects of it and people to come through that, to be shepherded. Thereby, those who have those things ultimately will make themselves the authority. Ultimately, they will, if they're not seeing that rightly, they will make themselves the authority. Those whom I mentioned who said, no, I'm going to be me. And I'm going to find some place that accepts me for me. What they've done is they've made themselves the authority rather than God's word. And this is the ultimate key to the relationship. That we who lead recognize that the only authority that we have is in God's word. Period. In other words, if there's ever a place, to just give you a funny example. You all know, you can see by my physical appearance, if you're, if you're new here, I don't have any hair. Right? And if you know me at all, you know I enjoy one of my hobbies is, is hunting. If I ever stand in this pulpit and tell you to be a good Christian or a better follower of Christ, you should shave your head and start hunting, you've recognized that I've drifted from, and again, in a funny example, but I've drifted from biblical truth and begin to exercise authority in a heavy-handed, personality-driven way. It should be clearly seen. If it's being taught properly, if those things are in place, you'll recognize that leadership. If they're not, you will become your own authority. And you will not recognize the authority that God's word has intended, the grace that God's word has in your life. Your leadership must have an exhibit, a high view of God. Our non-negotiables are not for you, they're for us in this. 
They must have and exhibit a commitment to the sufficiency of Scripture. Your counsel that you should receive from leadership should be that which begins and ends in God's Word. Period. They should have a biblical view of themselves and others. They should not think more highly of themselves than they ought. They should look with urgency, seeing men no longer in the flesh, but in the Spirit only. They should have a rightly defined purpose of the church. The four legs that we see should be a priority for them in their leadership role. And they also should have a right view of church leadership. Your leaders should view it through the lens of their responsibility, not through the lens of their authority. The view that says, I am my own authority, is a very destructive view from both directions. And sadly, there are churches all over who have redefined their ministry as meeting the felt needs of the customer, or on the flip side, as being shaped by the personality of the leader to the extent that they no longer resemble the church that's described in God's Word. They draw a great crowd, they do multiple things, but there's no truth, there's no sin being confronted through the teaching of truth. And there's no clear direction being given from God's Word. That's the only authority I have. What could I possibly, I say this all the time, there are those of you in this room who are more than twice my age. There are those of you in this room who have faced cancer. There are those of you in this room who have faced the loss of a child. There are those of you in this room who have faced things that I have no maturity nor capability to help you through, to give you counsel, to guide you in any way, and yet I am called to do that and capable for one reason and one reason only. Because God's word is sufficient for those things. It is the only basis for authority. It is the only basis for those things. And that should be your own expectation. Amen. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17, I want to give you a little understanding of the authority. Remember, we already saw in Matthew 20 that we who are in leadership should view it from the role of responsibility as servants. But there's a different perspective that's given in Scripture that doesn't contradict that. It's coming from a different perspective. Those who are under the leadership's perspective. 1 Timothy 5.17 he exhorts Timothy in this way and how to care for the church. He said, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. In 1 Thessalonians, he exhorts the church in Thessalonica, a young church, with these words in chapter 5, verses 12 through 13. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord, there's that authority, and they give you instruction. And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Now several terms that we have seen in Scripture come together this morning. Shepherd, overseer, servant, rule well, have charge over. And all of these find their place in this one statement. Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Over you in the Lord. That's the basis for how you should view the authority that the leadership of the church has. Their authority is not their own. I want you to understand this clearly. They are a gift from God given to his body. Ephesians 4 says God gave them to his body to guard, to care, to build up, to equip the individual members who make up the body. They are a gift from God to his body who have been entrusted with the difficult task of being a sheep who is called the shepherd sheep. A good test or measurement of this is, are they heralds of the king or of themselves? Who is it that they exalt? Are they continually pointing to their own ability? Or are they humbly saying, not in me, as the song we sang earlier? What standards are you admonished by? Are you admonished according to their expectation? Again, the, the, the haircut and, and hobby analogy? Are you admonished according to the clear teaching of God's word, which at times can be painful? A right expectation for you to have is for you to them, your leadership to have an open door policy. There's not a member in this church that should not be able to come in with any gripe, struggle, complaint, disagreement, or anything else that they have and come right through my door or to one of the other elders of this church and express that. However, the second half of that is it should be an open Bible policy. Within that, there should also be the measure where that Bible is open and it is the only authority. If you don't do that, then what you have at the end of the day is two people on opposite sides of the desk putting their opinions on the desk and seeing who can speak the loudest, 
whose opinion is strongest, who's most passionate about what they think. And there's no value nor fruit in that. But if God's word is upheld as the authority, then it should be going both directions into the lives of both the congregation and the leadership. There should be an open door and an open Bible policy. I would say this to you all. You should have a right expectation of your leadership. If you don't use the open door, we're not mind readers. That's not a gift found in any of the passages in Scripture. We are not given the ability to read your mind. And we also are not those who are perfect. We are sheep. Also, in the same station in many ways as you who are the congregation. We should be those who are exemplary, who are bearing out and affirmed in those qualifications. We should be above any legitimate reproach, and we should always be approachable. We also should have an open Bible desire as well. He tells us why. You are to love them. You are to love your leadership. It's an interesting thing. It's almost like there's oftentimes seems to be a love-hate relationship in many churches and many people that I talk to when they speak about the church, maybe that they left or something else. But it says in Scripture, 1 Thessalonians 5.13, you are to love them. Why? Because of their labor. Because of their labor. Not because of anything else. Not because he says the things you like. Not because he uh, enjoys the hobbies you enjoy. But because of their labor in your life. The question you should be asking is, is your leadership fulfilling its labor in your lives? Are they guarding you by admonishment and instruction? Are they serving you by equipping you for the work of ministry? Are they providing you with opportunities to serve the Lord through his body? And are you fulfilling your commands to them, loving them? And then finally, this last command, Hebrews 13, if you'll turn with me there. Are you submitting to them? Are you recognizing their authority as the Holy Spirit has given them, ordained them, anointed them to be in that role? <clears throat> the author of Hebrews sums up much of what we find in the book in verses, we'll just look at verse 17 with the time we have. Hebrews chapter 13. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Now I want to be clear, this is not the passage in Romans 13. This is not 1 Peter 2 dealing with secular authorities or governors. This is leadership within the church. And we know that because the next line, because they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. I think this verse shows us the balance of the right views most clearly. There's the, the command into the congregation, obey and submit, which has a sting. There's an owl that comes with that. But then there's the second half, because... They keep watch over your souls and will give an account to the Lord who knows everything. There's a sting to that as well. Now, with that being seen, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. Because the most valid argument that I oftentimes am given is simply the argument of, but you don't know what I've been through at the other churches. At the church I was at or where I grew up or this pastor did this or the elders did that. They handle themselves. And I've heard every horror story, I think. I've experienced some, sadly. I've heard everything from, from pastors robbing the church financially to adulterous charges to fornication, immorality. So many things. I've heard them. And that oftentimes, the horror stories of church leadership will become the excuse that people have to reject what Scripture says that we've just looked at today. And I want to give you the safeguard of Scripture. Remember, a commitment to the sufficiency of Scripture, a right view of these things, an understanding of that. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says, Here are the non-negotiables within the character of those who will be in leadership. When it says that you're to obey and submit to them, they should not be there having not first been walked through in these things. Listen to verse 1 and following of 1 Timothy 3. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work which he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach. This is kind of the archway over which all the rest fit under. This is speaking of the general character of the man. And I want to say this, legitimate approach. There were constantly people bringing accusations against Christ himself. He healed on the Sabbath. He eats with tax collectors. He does this. His disciples don't wash their hands. There must be legitimate approach, reproach. 
And then he goes on, he says, the husband of one wife. The, the literal translation is a one-woman man. Uh, imagine if we were to take more time. I'll never forget, in the first ordination service I was asked to sit in during the interim season, I sat in. We came to this conclusion. We came to this, to this qualification. And when I said, the husband of one wife, and begin to examine the young man, and this, his response was, I've never been divorced. Check, let's move on. And yet we see so many leaders in the church fall in this area of not being committed to their spouse. And I believe we're doing a disservice when we don't examine them because the weight of that responsibility is one that lends itself to this area. That's why the Holy Spirit, knowing, put this qualification in there. They should be one who is known for their commitment to their wife. You say, well, what if they're single? What if they're not married? Are they known as a flirt? Are they known as one who continually is, is toying with the emotions of the young women in, their, in, their, in the church around them? Again, there are ways to examine these things. The Holy Spirit doesn't say, well, I didn't think about that. No, they should be examined in this. And remember, and bear in mind as we look at each of these, the horror stories that sadly you may have experienced or, or at the very least have heard of. If they were examined and it was a non-negotiable that they be a one-woman man or they would not be in leadership, then that horror story would not be a reality. Then it goes on and lists out a listing, a, a stringing together of them. They must be temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable. A listing of these character qualities, not personality. Nowhere in here does it say he must be able to draw a crowd well. He must tell you what you want to hear. He must be able, no, he must be able to teach, rightly divide God's word. Absolutely. We saw that one earlier. However, there's nothing in this that fits within the pragmatic view of leadership that we've adopted. Instead, it lists these character qualities. I'll read them again and think again of the horror stories. One who's temperate. One who's prudent. One who's respectable. Hospitable. And then we see able to teach. Able to exhort in sound doctrine. Able to refute those who contradict. Able to rightly divide the word. Not addicted to much wine. We've seen that. We have seen where those who have uh, immoderate life in multiple ways and expressly in this area of addiction and the destruction and devastation it brings to the body. He goes on, he says, also they must not be pugnacious. Uh, that simply could translate to be striker. They must not be violent. If you have a fear of going before your elders, there's an issue, unless that fear is rooted in your own sin. But if there's a fear of how they would respond, they would respond with a lack of gentleness. There's an issue. They must not be pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable. The only fear you feel from them is if you are doing harm to the flock. Yes, we should deal with wolves rightly. Free from the love of money. I'll just say that again. It should be enough. They should be those who are free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man of God does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? He must be one who's proven, and there's an example that you can see in that. He must not be a new convert, so that he will not become conceited or puffed up. He will not fall into reproach in the snare of the, snare of the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Guys, that's a pretty encompassing list. It's one that should be held rightly. Again, no man can be perfect in these things, but exemplary, pursuing after, recognizing, and submitted to the authority and truth that is given to us here of these qualifications. With them held rightly in place, you should have the context and the confidence to be those who in Hebrews 13 and verse 17, it says you obey and submit to those you recognize the authority that God has given them in your lives. The final verse, section of this verse, speaks to the congregation again. Let them do so with joy. I didn't write that in there. But it's a very, I think, important place to examine. Would you say, say that in the shepherding moments in your life, that your leaders have found joy in shepherding you through them? Would they look back and say, what a grace, what a sweet maturity and growth and gentleness that we're seeing. What, what a grace, what a joy it is that they are a part of this church which I am entrusted with in shepherding. 
I don't say that in any negative term. I say that for you to examine yourself. That's not my examination over you. It's not my place to examine it. But it is yours. Would you, would you look at how you view and deal with the leadership and the truth from this pulpit and from their discipleship and from their work and labor of ministry in their lives? That they would look at that and say, what a joy. Because the author of Hebrews says, if not, there's no profit in it for you. It's been unprofitable for you. Leaders, aspiring leaders here within this body, see your role through the lens of the responsibility and accountability that you have to the flock and before the Lord. And members here today, see your leadership through the lens of the authority the Holy Spirit has given them based in the qualifications that are listed because they are responsible. We don't exercise authority out of compulsion. We don't exercise oversight out of these things. We do so because at the end of the day, no matter how angry you might be or how sad you might be with me, I have to stand before the Lord and give an account to him. And I want you to know this. Not only do I love him more than I love you, I fear him more than I fear you. And that's the attitude that should shape the leadership of any church. And let us never lose sight, brothers and sisters, that this is Christ's church. He is the head. It is given to his people and has been entrusted to his shepherds. But he is the head of his church. Is this your expectation of the church? Because it is non-negotiable number five for this church in our philosophy of ministry. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we are thankful for the gifts and the clarity you give us for the ways in which we are to serve you. For the ways in which we are to carry this out, Lord, we come confessing our imperfection, seeking your strength, knowing that it's only through your ability, through your strength, that we accomplish anything, Lord, even as we, as we labor to pursue hard after the righteousness which we have been enslaved to by our salvation. Lord, I pray for this church body. I pray that you would guard the leadership, that we would maintain our view of responsibility, that we would uphold it in each other's lives. Lord, that we would truly, as iron upon iron, sharpen one another in these things. Lord, I pray for the congregation, that out of a love and recognition for you, that they would submit themselves to the authority of your word, that they would examine their leaders in light of these things, that they would recognize the truth of your word, and Lord, that it would carry great weight in each of our lives. Lord, I thank you for the clarity of your word. I thank you for the, the gift of your church, and I thank you that we can gather this morning to your glory to our own edification in all of the ways that you have given us. Lord, I pray that even as we sing in closing, that we would do so lifting praises to your name, submitting ourselves to your word, loving you as the head who is over us, who has served us and given himself a ransom that we might gather even today. Lord, we thank you for these things, asking them in your son Christ's name. Amen.